I'm Carmine Gallo, and today I am talking to somebody who knows how to create content that people love. Kevin Getz is the author of Audienceology, How Moviegoers Shape the Films We Love. We are going to take you into a, a fascinating and kind of a secretive process of audience testing of Hollywood movies. But more importantly, we're going to show you how it applies to business storytelling. Hi, Kevin. How are you? I'm great. So good to be here. Yeah, and th thank you. I, I love this book because it shows how, how real people have an influence over many of the movies that we see. And I'm sure most movie fans don't know this. So you are the uh, CEO of Screen Engine ASI, which conducts research for, I believe, two thirds of all of the major movies that are widely released in, in America and around the world. I mean, do yeah. you have that much influence in the audience testing for these big movies? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, my team and I, I mean, I have uh, 300 employees uh, who help uh, work on this and a number of other areas in the content testing business, as well as the branding area and so forth. But mostly, I would say 95% uh, have to do with television and movies. You lead these focus groups for movies that in many cases are movies that in their original cut do not play to their fullest potential. And then based on the analysis from the focus groups that you conduct, filmmakers will often go back to those movies, make some tweaks, some adjustments, some major, some minor, but help that movie turn into a hit. Would that be a fair explanation of the role that you play? It's exactly and beautifully characterized. That's exactly what well, it I is. am a journalist. Thank you. Well, I know, but <laughs> I, a lot of people sort of uh, dance around it. And mm. that's really the essence of what the test screening process offers, which is, you know, showing a movie to the people that it's intended to ultimately uh, be produced for, right? And gauge their reaction. And what are they responding to? What are they not responding to? And if they're not responding to something, are there fixes and changes that can help them to embrace it more and ultimately then recommend it more to others? Because word of mouth is still the most important thing, whether a movie is in a movie theater or on a streaming service, the word of mouth is so key. And as you know, Carmine, back in so many product categories, not only movies and television, you know, people's personal endorsement, people who you trust, personal endorsement is the most potent uh, form of advertising. Then you've answered one of my questions uh, I was going to ask you. When test audiences are asked to fill out a survey yes. after they watch the, the first cuts or these uh, original drafts of movies, they're asked at least two dozen, more than two dozen questions, such as what was your reaction to a film? Mm -hmm. uh, did it meet your expectations? But I even flagged it here. I said to myself, I bet the most important question that Kevin asks is, will you recommend it to a friend? Well, it's actually not only the one that I think is most important, but it's the one that correlates the most to actual results in the real world. That is really? to say that if you have a certain level of people definitely recommending something, that correlates to the legs or how long, the longevity of how long, uh, long a, a, a movie might stay out in a theater or how many, uh, how many weeks, for example, it might remain in the zeitgeist, in the buzz if it's on a streamer. Word of mouth in terms of the definite recommend, not the probable recommend, mm. certainly not if you're not gonna recommend it, but that definite recommend is also important to the actual success uh, and uh, of a of a property. There's a perfect example in the book, La La Land. You said that test audiences were confused during the original draft of the movie because they did not see singing and dancing for about 12 minutes into the original movie. Based on that analysis, filmmakers went back and added what now we've, we've seen as the overture, the big song and dance number right at the beginning of the movie that takes place in, in Los Angeles traffic. Is that an example of how audience feedback can take an already good movie 
and turn it into a classic? Well, yes, but in that case, that was a little different. I mean, in all fairness to the filmmakers, they had shot that sequence already and were trying an experiment. And the experiment was, we want to get on with the picture and we think maybe that opening is maybe slowing it down or not uh, necessary. When in but fact- again, it, all on, based on audience feedback, oh, yeah, not yeah, just yeah. on but three they, people they, in a they, room. They, listen, you can feel it in the room because you can't start a musical without- um, without music, because you're not sending the right sort of tonal message in tonality to the audience. So the audience then has to work really hard to say, well, how am I supposed to think about this? Am I supposed to laugh? Am I supposed to sit back and enjoy the music? Until 12 minutes of the movie when you say, what? They're singing and dancing. Now, yeah. in fairness, again, there would have been advertising that would have set people up sure. to, to know yeah. that they were going to see a musical. But still in all, even if you knew that, you'd probably be confused and saying, well, I thought I was coming to see a musical. Where's the music? So it was a it was a happy accident. It was a an experiment that proved that you had to set it up with that sequence. And and to many folks, many audience members, they felt that sequence was just terrific. I love that sequence. Oh, yeah, so do I. Uh, but you have so many other examples in the book. Uh, again, I don't think most people know this. The endings too, Fatal Attraction to Thelma and Louise, uh, those were all based on audience feedback to the original. Uh, th there's stories of you sitting in, in an audience uh, testing session with Tom Cruise watching Mission Impossible. Uh, all of this reminds me of something, Kevin, and now I'm going to apply it to business storytelling. It reminds me that creativity is collaborative. We hear these stories about the lone director or even a lone songwriter who doesn't want anyone to mess with their work. That's not the way great art, is, especially in the way we consume it today, it's not the way great art is created these days, is it? Well, we just witnessed the Academy Awards last night, the Oscars, and Clearly, if it teaches you anything, it teaches you how collaborative movie making is and how necessary people are to the process of movie going, of movie making. You're exactly right. I mean, if you think about it, a painter doesn't like her painting. She puts it in the back of her closet. A, a writer doesn't like his novel. He puts it in the back of his drawer. But a movie, you know, if you did that, you'd be you'd be using someone else's money yeah. to say. Uh, you know, a director saying, well, I don't like the work. They don't get a choice to distribute it or not, right? I mean, every now and then there's this sort of yeah. auteur uh, exception to that, but we're talking about 99.9% .9 of all product. You are beholden to uh, a lot of other artists mm -hmm. to create a great piece of, of, of movie magic. And that does not require one person, a director, clearly it's a director's vision, it's a director's medium or a producer's, mm -hmm. uh, usually a collaboration of both. And then many other folks stand in support of that vision. And the test screening process by allowing moviegoers into that process at the right time, mm -hmm. it enables the vision to become even clearer because what those filmmakers might've set out mm -hmm. to communicate wasn't actually communicated not what they thought was being communicated. So it's really interesting and important to get that feedback. Moviegoers aren't going to tell you how to fix it. They're going to just tell you how they're feeling. Yeah. Are they satisfied? Are they not satisfied? It's up to you, creative person, mm -hmm. persons, to figure out why they're saying what they're saying and to fill in those blanks and or cut and or change and or dare I say reshoot. Those are solutions that can all be in service of communicating the messaging that was trying to get through in the first place. So in other words, I like to say the audience test screening process almost actualizes the vision even better than without doing it, you know, because you're getting validation often. Well said, well said. Uh you and I both think deeply about storytelling. You come to it from the filmmaker's perspective. I come to it from, from business and, and uh, presentation skills. I wrote the first book on how Steve Jobs story 
tell or story told through presentations, uh, how great TED speakers will often tell stories. So I look at it more from the, the business presentation perspective. Uh, but you do write in your book that you believe that I think how all scientists now are believing that we are wired for stories, that we are a storytelling species. But here's what you write. I like to believe that we are born movie critics, that when we spot a flaw in a film, it's our DNA telling us so, that when we enter the movie theater, we are bringing thousands, maybe millions of years of human evolution with us. I agree. I think a lot of scientists agree that we are wired now for story. So if that's the case, do you think that movies, and again, I'm trying to apply it to presentations as well, do you think that there are common elements to storytelling that audiences crave, that they love throughout generations? Yeah, I think there's five essential areas that I typically pinpoint, and I write about them in my next book called uh, How to Score in Hollywood. That's and why I didn't see it here, did I? I didn't see five elements to great stories. No, nope, you did not. No, you did <laughs> okay, not. there you go. We're not, we'll have to have but another interview. And, uh, and I'd, love to, I'd like to actually interview you for the second book, Carmine. I'm I'd not love kidding. To. I'd love I, to. I, it's really what the second book is about is, is sort of getting to the green light process. Yeah. And what are those elements that create successful movies? And why do some movies work and some don't? Can you and tease how, us? Can you tell me what the five elements are? I will share them with you. Essentially, yep. they are, uh, first and foremost, a character with whom you invest in uh, and their journey. And that's super important. A protagonist who's, who, who is empathetic and who you care about. Okay. Uh, the second, and in no particular order, by the way, uh, is an ending that is both intellectually and emotionally satisfying. You might get questions answered, but you're left feeling kind of lousy, like it doesn't hit that. And it doesn't have to be happy by any stretch, but it feels right. And it feels that's when I say audiences can know when something's not right. They can't articulate necessarily what they're feeling, but they'll say, eh, eh, it's OK. I okay. didn't really Char character and ending okay. character and ending. The next one is you don't want to ever end on a major confusion. Uh, that is to say, you can have an ambiguous ending, but a confusion that did not get cleared up by the end, I call that a frustrating confusion or a bad confusion. There are good confusions too, but I'm talking about a bad or frustrating one. Don't want to end on that in that way. And so many movies have done that over the years, and I can't tell you how many audiences, how many people in audiences and how the audience overall will say, well, that was strange or why did they do that? Or that let me down different than the satisfaction of the ending. It's really right. something that could really be addressed and fixable often goes unfixed. And sometimes the director wants to leave the audience with a certain way and so forth, but there's a way to do both. And it's a sophisticated way often, but it can happen. So we've got character, satisfying ending, avoid confusion, Yep. What are the last two elements of great stories? The last is, uh, or the last two are uh, pace. Mm -hmm. um, it's important to have a movie that is paced correctly. And that is to say, you don't want to the audience to get ahead of the movie. So you don't want to go too slowly so that they are figuring out what's going to happen. Uh, you also don't want to go so fast as to, uh, you know, not have the movie breathe and allow for those sort of emotional um, areas that are uh, essential, right? And that's that's an important distinction. Uh, both of those uh, are important in the in the cutting uh, of an editorial process. The other thing is that, and this is kind of uh, along the same lines, and I'll, so it could almost be five and six. It has to have an authenticity. Uh, hmm. Audiences today are very keen on things feeling um, authentic and real. Now, that doesn't mean that a superhero movie that lives in its own sort of universe and world uh, can't adhere to that. They must. In fact, the, the one that I said could be six, but I think it's a, an extension of five, is that one must respect 
the movie rules, the rules that are set up. So for example, you have a science fiction or a horror movie. The horror movie has a character who's a slasher as the, as the villain. And nowhere does this character show any special superpowers other than um, surprising people and killing them with a knife, right? Mm -hmm. But in the final scene, uh, he, usually it's a he, uh, comes into a room and picks up his last vic victim and tosses the, him through the window and out, and he goes 30 feet. Right, yeah, I've seen that scene a million times, okay. Well, if that's never happened in the movie, the audience is going to completely say you've breached the rules. This character wouldn't do that. That is that's interesting. And so you must, directors are going to yeah. want to break the rules, won't they? It's well, fascinating. You know, it's the movie rules that the director and or writer have set up. Uh, you can't betray those. Wow. You can, and by the way, if you did set up that this slasher took a certain pill and had superhuman powers or something early on, you can certainly do that. That's not what I'm saying. It's saying don't change the rules on the audience midway through. You've got to be consistent, which has to do with authenticity. Yeah. But the authenticity I'm talking about is wherever world we're in, you want to be true to it. Mm -hmm. I love that. I, I love that. Um, uh, finally, I want to end with, I don't I uh, yeah. want to finish this interview without mentioning something that, again, applies to business storytelling. You sure. said a common criticism by moving going audiences is that a film is predictable. Well, that's I assume that's why memorable films, uh, many of them have a surprise or, or suspense or something unexpected in them. Uh, well, Kevin, I'm going to argue that's the same for a good presentation. Audiences are constantly asking What's different? What's new? In the neuroscience literature, we call it novelty. Uh, you have to surprise the audience and break an expectation. It seems to me like there is a very much of an overlap between the creative process with filmmaking and uh, the other type of creative process, whether it's writing or creating a, a presentation. I think people want things that they're familiar with, that they're comfortable with, and they, they basically can frame within their own sort of psyches. But I also think they want something different within that framework. Wow, that's they don't where the achieve. art comes in. That sounds so difficult to achieve. It is where the art comes in. It's exactly right. So remember, there's only X number of stories, whatever it is. If you ask some story sort of geniuses, they'll tell you there's only six or stories or 12 stories. And, you know, man versus nature and man versus man and that, you know, that kind of thing. But, and that's probably true. That's the archetype, right? But if you start going into how, what is the execution like? Like I saw a movie, I tested a movie about uh, three weeks ago. Uh, it's a, on a streamer, it is one of the most theatrically worthy movies, you know, cause now the haves and have nots are in the theater, meaning okay. mm -hmm. the ones that are huge, call to action to leave your house to see usually have great special effects and same as no, almost no drama now will work yeah. in a movie theater. So the idea of that was so prevalent. These are two major filmmakers who have done many theatrical movies and it felt similar to a couple of movies that I've seen, but different enough that made it so friggin' cool. And I went, this is, this is the bomb. This movie is so good. Mm -hmm. And it's, and it's different than what I've seen, but I've seen it before. Does that make sense? Yes, and, of course. Yeah. And so as, a, as a, an experience, it felt like a complete meal. Kevin Getz, Audienceology, thank you so much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to meet you and to get a little bit of insight into this fascinating You're terrific, process. Carmine. I, I had a great time, and I hope we get to do this again. We will. Thank you.